During the month of May, June, and July, the United States took large strides forward in space exploration. Under the direction of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, the sixth of the Saturn I giant space boosters was launched on May 28th. All have been successful. Ten launches are scheduled for this phase of the research and development program. The next series, designated Saturn 1B, will employ a more powerful second stage and is slated as launch vehicle for the manned Apollo spacecraft. An active guidance system was employed for the first time on this launch of the Apollo boilerplate model. The payload, designed to eventually carry three men to the moon and weighing more than 37,000 pounds, was one of the largest ever orbited. Secondary objectives included testing of structural and flight control systems and jettisoning of the escape tower in flight. Standing more than 190 feet tall, the Saturn requires a service tower, or gantry, 37 stories high, thought to be the largest movable structure in the world. Saturn, mightiest of America's rockets, will develop over a million pounds of thrust to push it beyond Earth's atmosphere and into space, consuming propellant at almost 6,000 pounds per second the rocket roars into space. Spatial fiber optic lenses enable the onboard cameras to record propellant flow. The cameras are then jettisoned and recovered downrange by an Air Force pararescue team. Riding atop a tail of flame over 300 feet long, the space giant shoulders its way into the sky, sending to Earth vast quantities of information from the 1,300 sensing devices on board. Far above the Earth, cameras record separation. The spent first stage drops away and will burn up on re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. The Navy's Polaris submarines continued demonstration and shakedown operations in the waters off Cape Kennedy. Launches such as this constantly test both sub and crew capability. Often submarines will launch two or three missiles in rapid succession, requiring great speed and skill on the part of the crew. The A-2 seen here is currently active with the fleet. This 1,500 mile range solid propellant missile has proven its reliability time and again on the range. The third in the Atlas Centaur series was launched from Cape Kennedy on June 30th. Centaur is being developed to launch unmanned surveyor spacecraft to soft land on the moon, take measurements of the lunar landscape, and search out possible landing sites for future astronauts. Designated AC-3, this was one of eight scheduled research and development missions planned by the National Aeronautics and the Space Administration to qualify Centaur as a medium-weight launch vehicle. Centaur is also under consideration for Mariner missions to Venus and Mars. Although not completely successful, the AC-3 did meet several test requirements. Special insulation panels designed to prevent vaporizing of the liquid hydrogen in the Centaur stage were successfully ejected. The powerful hydrogen must be kept at a temperature of minus 423 degrees while in the heavy atmosphere of Earth. Once in space, however, the panels are no longer needed and are ejected, increasing payload capacity by 1,200 pounds. Second of the test objectives met was restart of the boost pumps. Triggered by a timing device aboard the rocket, they reignited the engines for about 50 seconds. However, the engines shut down prematurely and the Centaur failed to achieve orbit velocity. On June 30th, Colonel Andrew Wright, engineering chief for the 6555th Aerospace Test Wing, presided at topping off ceremonies for the Titan III Vertical Integration Building. Colonel G.A. Finley, chief of the Corps of Engineers, and other officials watched as the final flag decorated 25-foot steel beam was raised into place, 140 working days after construction began. 
the 26-story vertical integration building will be capable of handling four of the huge Titan III core boosters simultaneously. Titan III's core is scheduled for launch late this summer. On the 31st of July, a change of command ceremony was held at Patrick Air Force Base. After the orders of the day were read, the military complement of Patrick passed in review honoring the new commander. Colonel Julian Blyer took command of Patrick Air Force Base and the 6550th Air Base Group from Colonel Henry Dittman, who leaves for a new assignment. Colonels Richardson, Blyer, and Dittman took the review. Following the ceremony, Colonel Blyer and his wife discussed their new assignment with Colonel and Mrs. Dittman. This is the newest version of the Polaris, the A-3, undergoing pre-launch checkout at Cape Kennedy. A refinement of the A-1 and A-2, the A-3 is over 85% a new missile. The A-3, in its final stages of development, is scheduled to be operational with the fleet during 1964. One of the highly successful research and development programs, the first successful sub-launch of an A-3 was in October of 1963. Pad firings are an intermediate step in the testing before going to sea to be fired from the observation island, and then from Polaris submarines during shakedown operations. The bullet-shaped missile is powered by a solid propellant, as are the A-1 and A-2. Improved fuel and the spun glass fiber first and second stage motor casings were instrumental in giving the A-3 a 2,500 mile range. Inertial guidance in the Polaris is the smallest in use in United States ballistic missiles. After a program of extensive land firings and dry launches from the observation island, the Polaris weapon systems go to sea in submarines. Here the missile is again put to the acid test, an underwater launch testing missile and crew alike. Each of the sub's two crew complements must receive certification before joining the fleet on an operational status. Only after numerous such tests and analyzation of all the data accumulated, as well as reaching a high degree of perfection in the system itself, will the Navy place the missile on operational duty. Testing, reporting, checking three of numerous steps in ensuring the reliability of the missile for safeguarding the nation and the men whose job it is to man our deterrent forces throughout the world. In advance of every launch, all systems are thoroughly checked out. Certain tests are to simulate the stresses of in-flight conditions. Here, one of the twin nuclear detection satellites undergoes a spin test for dynamic balancing before being mated to the second stage of an Atlas Agena launch vehicle. The twin detection satellites, second in the successful Vela satellite program, carried sensors to measure X-rays, gamma rays, and neutrons, the products of a nuclear detonation. At the same time, a third satellite designed to study the Van Allen radiation belt was carried aloft as a passenger. Launched by the Air Force in conjunction with the Advanced Research Projects Agency, the program sponsor, and the Atomic Energy Commission, the two satellites were placed into elliptical orbit about 55,000 miles above the Earth. A ground-transmitted command signal ignited a solid rocket aboard the spacecraft, which injected the first satellite into circular orbit 19 hours after launch. Forty hours later, a similar signal from another ground station kicked the second satellite into circular orbit. Circling the globe almost 100,000 miles apart, the satellites provide excellent space surveillance. These super-sensitive 20-sided satellites are designed to distinguish natural radiations from those caused by a test detonation in outer space. Timing, accuracy, and the complete success of this project marked another giant stride forward for the United States providing space centuries for the free world. The third of a planned series of six asset glide reentry vehicles was launched from Cape Kennedy on the 22nd of July under Air Force direction. 
Designed to study high-velocity re-entry problems, the vehicle was launched by a Thor Delta rocket. After reaching an altitude in excess of 40 miles, assets streaked back through the Earth's atmosphere at more than 18,000 feet per second, splashing into the sea 1,400 miles down the eastern test range. In five minutes, the vehicle had been located by range aircraft, and Air Force pararescue men were in the water attaching extra flotation devices. Telemetry on board the speeding craft functioned perfectly and nearly 100% of the test objectives were met. ASSET is another example of a military civilian team working for advancement in space exploration. The date is June 22nd, NASA's hangar A&M at the Cape. This is the arrival of Ranger 7. In these carefully packed containers are the components of a craft that will accomplish one of the most significant achievements in space history. Under ultra-clean conditions, technicians inspect every minute detail of the complex system. Though thousands of hours have gone into assembling and preparing Ranger, its systems must again be rechecked and tested. Accuracy and reliability are keynotes. Ranger 7's mission sounded simple. Obtain and transmit to Earth close-up photographs of the lunar surface. But accomplishing this would be no easy matter. Six predecessors have failed to complete their lunar missions. All six, however, contributed to a further knowledge of the intricate problems of sending a spacecraft nearly a quarter million miles to impact with a moving body in space. On the 28th of July, Ranger 7 was sent aloft by the dependable Atlas Agena booster. One hour after launch, as the Agena stage fell back toward Earth, two panels on the craft unfolded to provide over 24 square feet of solar cell area, capable of delivering 200 watts of raw power to the spacecraft. Ranger vehicle sped through space, it performed thousands of intricate tasks to ensure collision with the moon. 100,000 miles from Earth, almost halfway to the moon, a final course correction was made, and Ranger zeroed in on the sea of clouds. The craft, weighing a mere 806 pounds, carried six RCA-designed television cameras. The cameras were turned on by a command signal from Earth after approximately 68 hours of flight. In perfect position, Ranger began recording and transmitting pictures as it hurtled toward its target at over 4,000 miles per hour. Four of Ranger's cameras took pictures every two-tenths of a second. The picture interval for the other two cameras was two and a half seconds. At the same time, back on Earth, the Air Force's telescope television camera at Patrick Air Force Base, Florida, was trained on the sea of clouds to record the final stage of flight. However, no impact effects were seen. Cameras on board the craft functioned perfectly. These photos are actual pictures from Ranger's cameras. From an altitude of 470 miles, the moon's surface appeared much the same as through a telescope. The picture covers 78 miles on a side and craters approximately 800 feet in diameter are plainly visible. At 34 miles, craters of 100 feet show plainly. These craters are part of the outlying rays from Copernicus, 2.3 seconds before impact. Only three miles high, the picture now shows an area about one and two-third miles on a side. The craters are about 30 feet in diameter and 10 feet deep. A rock mass is clearly visible in one of them. Then. Ranger 7 rammed into the moon, fulfilling its mission. Ranger, 
a project of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, accomplished a feat which has intrigued man since the beginning of time. A close look at the moon. <laughs>